Thank you. So I was going to do, um, I was told this wasn't a title conference, so it's a mix. So I was going to do a, about half of this quarter an hour on just title generally and where it's sort of come from, and then talk about the major end project and, and where that is for the, for the second half. So, so Atlantis is um, both a turbine company, so we're developing this turbine, which I'll talk about, about in the later on. Um, but it is also a project development company, in that it's sort of quite unusual among the Tidal developers. Most of those have been engineering companies developing a device. Atlantis has really been developing projects for which it needs a device. Um, and Magen is one of our projects. So we actually, it's been a bit of a history. It was, it was initiated by Atlantis. It was then mostly sold off. So we sold off 90% of it, and then we got most of it back. So we now own 85% of Magen. So it's... It is one of our projects, so we treat it actually as a separate company and, and contract with it differently. So that's, that's the company I work for. Tidal power, I'm sure you, most of you are familiar with this. So in, t in the incarnation we're doing is horizontal axis rotors, light wind turbines underwater, just using the kinetic energy of the water. Um, cables to shore, there are... Um, you know, spots around the world, not everywhere, but <coughs> bits of the coasts that have a reasonably strong tidal current that you can use and generate power from. And it's another sort, source of renewable energy. It is um, predictable. Um, it's not consistent because you get springs and neap tides, so strong tides one week, um, low, lower tides the next week. Um, underwater, so people can't see it, so environmentally people quite like it. Um, it's not like wind turbines. It has a number of advantages, but it is difficult to do. It's working in a very extreme environment. Um, it's expensive to do, and I'll say later, but effectively we've proved that it works technically. You can generate power from the sea quite reasonably. Economically, is the, that's the thing we have to prove next. Tidal power has been around for a bit. Um, this one down here is a tidal mill. There's one down of, of these near Southampton that's been restored, which you can go and see. But they have been around for a bit, so just like a water wheel that uses the, the tide coming in and out. And these, this is in America, but there are quite a few around the world. Um, similar principles to, to run of the river water mills, but the idea is still the same. But that led, or from that, has developed um, this in France, Laurence, which is 250 megawatt, which is one of the oldest schemes, 1965. Um, it's basically just hydropower, but with a very low head. Um, it's been copied, if you like, in Korea. Slightly bigger. I wondered if they just put the extra four on so that they beat Laurence. But that was commissioned just a few years ago. These are, are, are you know, perfectly straightforward. They're just big civil engineering projects. And uh, in the UK, people have been talking about the Bristol channel to seven barrage for quite a while, but the government aren't supporting it. Whether it happens, we shall see. Um, a sort of halfway house to a full seven barrage is this. This is the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, which is proposed. It's really in discussions with government as to whether they'll get its sufficient support or not. I think I put down the edge there. 96.5 is the rumoured um, price of electricity feeding tariff that they're aiming for, but for a very long period. I think that's for 35 years or something like that. But it's not that far off where nuclear is, um, but it's, the government appears to be just sort of kicking it around at the moment rather than making a decision. But this allows you to do um, tidal range without the huge environmental impacts of doing a barrage on a, on a river. So it's probably a good starting point. Something over here, there. Tidal stream has been around for a while. This is um, yeah, 1731. This is on the Thames. It was under the old London Bridge in the Thames and was used for um, bringing up drinking water, though I'm slightly surprised that the water quality was good enough to drink, but maybe that wasn't an issue then. Um, so that's just using the flow to turn a wheel. So it's been around for you know, a few hundred years. Um, I have found a reference to someone doing a, a little electricity generator on the Rhine in about 18-something, um, 1860, I think it was, 
uh, with, a, with a picture, but I've lost the picture of it. But, uh, so people have been trying to use flow to generate electricity also for quite a long time. Um, there have been quite a lot of very small prototypes around people testing, you know, a couple of kilowatts or a few tens of kilowatts. Um, these were really the first of the, uh, the larger prototypes. They're sort of, it's a step towards the megawatt machines that we're getting now, but it's, um, these were an important step on that way. So this one is, I was involved with this, I was actually project manager for this, started by a company called IT Power, which then set up marine current turbines. Um, in the Bristol Channel here, near Lynmouth, um, designed to come up and down the water, just like the sea gen did, one did in the Strangford Lock, the two rotors on a thing that you'll have seen in the iconic pictures. Around about the same time, Hammerfest, a Norwegian company, set up this in a fjord in Norway. Same size, and the, the, the projects were neck and neck, including all the delays and things, so they all went in about the same time. Um, a bit later, but you know, these... This is Open Hydro, their open centre turbine. This actually came out of a group in Florida originally that were doing um, river turbines. The idea of it was that it didn't chew up fish. They could go through the middle. And they played around with using it in the sort of Gulf Stream. Um, and then it came across this side of the Atlantic and has been developed as Open Hydro. And has now been taken over by DCNS and is still producing turbines. It installed one in, I think, uh, Bay of Fundy just a couple of weeks ago. There have been quite a wide variety of concepts. I have to apologise that I've missed some, including Stevens, I'm afraid. But uh, th there's far less concepts than there are for wave power. Um, the wave power, I don't know, I don't know if anybody's ever counted the number of wave power concepts. It's a lot. This is it's a bit more restricted in what you can do. Um, some of the more unusual ones are this one, Stingray, which was tested, again, for 2000 and seven or eight or something like that. It's a flapping device. Um, and a company called Pulse Tidal tried a, a two-bladed one of these or, um, out of sync a while ago. That's, I don't think anything's happening with that at all now. Um, nobody's developing it. Um, Minesto, sort of flying kite. This thing does a figure of eights. Um, the idea being that if you make it go fast, you can have a very small turbine here. Um, I always find it, you know, making... Believing that one of these would do that for 20 years is, well, maybe controls better than I sort of imagined, but, uh, but it's, it's a good way of using deep water, but it takes up quite a lot of space. There are the uh, sort of lawnmower or combine harvester type machines here, which is horizontal axis. These are quite a good idea, I think, because they're actually the right shape um, for, for tidal flow, but they are taking a while to get going. There's another company, Kepler Energy. There are a couple of other people who do similar sort of things. This ORPC is a, an American company. Um, but these are, are slowly coming. But all these are, are fairly small and developing rather than um, having been proven. Um, this one here is a, just a, an alternative. It's two things that came out of a company called Tidal Stream developed this way of supporting turbines. It's a thing that sits in the water column and just weather vanes round. But it... Uh, comes up to the surface, floats up to the surface when you want to do repairs. It sort of flips over on its back and comes up. But then a company called Schottel in Germany is trying to develop these small sort of 50 kilowatt-ish type rotors. Um, and they've combined those two concepts to get something that they say will be easier because you can use lots of small machines. But uh, it's still a horizontal axis machine. It's just a different way of doing it. I think I've got a couple more. Flue mill is a really rather unusual one, a sort of Archimedes screw um, thing that has been tested at small scale at Orkney. Um, I've not seen any results. I, mean, I think, presume it works, but I don't know what it does. Tidal sails is... Actually, Atlantis started with something not too dissimilar from this. Um, it's basically a sort of conveyor belt with blades on it that you put across the stream. Again, it's the right shape for a river, which is good, or a tidal stream, but it's quite difficult to make all the, the cables and bits survive underwater and not rot. Um, people are using vertical axis machines. This is, uh, there are a few companies doing this. Blue Energy was one that came out of some, a Canadian research program in the 80s. Um, I think they've still got a website, but I don't think anything's happening. But there are a few people who've taken that on. So there are some other concepts, but they're doing things. So where we are now is quite a few people have done large-ish prototypes, by that I mean a megawatt or so. 
Um, so there's us. We did a one megawatt version first, which was actually fixed pitch. Now changed to a variable pitch. Open Hydro has got bigger. Um, I think they call this a two megawatt device, though I think in all, all practical currency it only produces about 700. Um, Hammerfest, this is the other company that's involved at Magen. Scott Renewables have a floating two megawatt machine that I don't know if I'm not sure it's quite been installed, but it's, it's close to being installed. Um, there is G Renewable Energy. This was Tidal Generation Limited that I also worked for, that then became Alston, that be then became GE Renewables in a sort of monopoly game of swapping companies. Um, they are technically still alive, but you don't hear very much about it. I think they're supposed to be producing a machine for the French site, but uh, that's delayed a bit. There's a lot of other companies doing small machines. Nova Innovation you may have heard of. They're Scottish. Verdant Power is in East River in New York. Um, Shuttle I talked about, ORPC. Sabella is a French company that just installed something. So a lot of people doing the sort of next scale down. Uh, somewhere over here that this seems to work. The, um, this is really just a prompt. This actually came out from the Energy Technologies Institute, um, a project that we were involved with, looking, trying to future gaze and see where things were going in uh, 20 years or 2020 and 2050 and seeing what the prices could come down to, what you could achieve. Um, I think this is fairly racy, optimistic, but it just shows the principle that you've got to get the price down to something that is sensible in order to, for this to work. You, you know, we're not, it's not a charity. We've actually got to generate money. Um, so we're talking of, what units are we? <coughs> so offshore wind is at you know, 10p, 10.5p. Um, 105 pounds a megawatt um, is the, the upper limit for bids and for the feed-in tariff in the latest round. Um, you know, it doesn't look like Tidal's going to get there any anytime very quickly, but the potential, we think, if you could produce quite a lot of innovations and get the volumes up, um, to get down to you know similar sort of levels, but I say you have to take these forward-looking studies with a slight pinch of salt. Um, and the interesting thing at the moment is the government is, is playing a slightly strange game um, that they have announced that uh, Tidal can bid for um, feeding tariffs at up to 30p. Um, but we are in direct competition with wind, offshore wind, which is 10.5p. Uh, so unless there aren't enough offshore wind projects, there's no way Tidal is going to get a, a bid. So you sort of feel they're not being quite genuine about this, about really wanting it to happen. So it's caused quite a hiatus in the industry at the moment as to where things are going because you can't, in your, on your fifth machine or second machine, produce something that's uh, competitive with offshore wind, which has been going for, for many years and produced hundreds of megawatts. Um, and government support is really quite a, an issue. Well, it isn't actually really government support because the feeding tariffs isn't subsidised by the government, it's uh, subsidised by the consumer. Um, but Given the chance, we hope to sort of go through the early stages, the sort of valley of death, and get out to, to something that's the other side. So, Maygen. This is the Maygen project. This is pretty much John O'Groats, if you do your lands into John O'Groats things. If you stand at John O'Groats, you're about here, and you can see the site. So it's Pentland Firth, which is probably one of the best tidal resources in the world. Um, the, the sea on this side and the sea on that side, the North Sea and the Atlantic are out of phase, so you get these very big flows coming through here and through a lot of the Orkneys. Um, we've got this area in Inner Sound between the island of Stroma and the mainland, um, which has currents of up to about five metres per second on um, spring tides. Um, so it really races through there, as it does through here, um, you know, such that its you know, shipping has some difficulty going through there and tends to go through with the tide. Um, we've got a, license, a Crown Estate license for this site, which was granted some years ago, um, for 398 megawatts. It's probably more than the channel can stand, actually, um, but in theory we could build out to that. Um, then there are marine consents to actually build it out up to 86 megawatts, which was given in 2013, um, and that's what we're working within at the moment. 
Phase 1A, which is what is happening at the moment, and I'll show you some pictures of that, is um, for was 51 million for four machines, four one and a half megawatt machines. Um, the funding was raised in 2014. It's going in now, so it takes quite a while to get these things in. Um, two machines are now in. One, two are to go. Um, as I said earlier, we own about 85% of Major, and so it's it's sort of technically our project, but we are treating it as a as a separate company, probably because. Well, mostly because um, it's likely that we would sell this on to somebody else when it's developed and then continue developing sites somewhere else and machines somewhere else. I think I've said most of this. So we have phase 1A, which is currently in, by 2018, we hope to do another four machines, maybe three or four, we're just talking about this at the moment. And then the final bit is to take it back up to the 86 megawatts Phase two, which will need sort of further consent, will take it out to um, 312. There are some sort of hurdles in this. We have to, uh, between 1A and 1B, we have to produce sort of reports on the environmental impact that we're not doing any damage to things, and that will keep going. It's one of the first large arrays. It will take a time before people get comfortable with it. So, pictures. Um, this is the really the first... Well, not quite the first, but almost the first work at the site. 2015, last year. This is a DP dynamically positioned vessel laying the cable out to where the turbines are. So that's where the cables, will, the turbines will be. You have shore works here. You'll see a picture of a building later that's now there. And the cable, we have one cable per turbine that runs out through here, picks up on the foundations out at sea. Another picture of the same thing, support vessel, um, multi-cap, and then this vessel out at sea doing it, works through the night. They're expensive. These things can cost 80,000, 100,000 a day to operate um, when, when the oil market's good. At the moment, they're quite a bit cheaper, which is handy, but it uh, depends what's going on. Um, some of the other work that's going on in parallel with that, actually before that cable installation happens, we did this, which is um, directional drilling. So you drill from the shore under the, um, the beach to take the cable out. You then pull the cable through from the shore out and take it up. No, yes, other way, and then pull it back in. Um, and that avoids quite a lot of the problems of going through the sort of littoral zone. We also had to do some grid reinforcement. The grid is very weak in places like this. Um, um, so this was a 17-kilometer extension of the grid underground for a bit, other, okay, above ground other places. That's the building, which you'll see again later. So this is the building. This got uh, looks a bit like a farm building. This has got the Prince of Wales involved in terms of uh, what it looked like. Uh, all sorts of people had a had a view on what it should look like, and I think I mean the idea is really to make it as inconspicuous as possible. Um, so it does just look like a you know, farm building that's sitting there, barn or something. But inside it's... Ah, wrong way. Inside it's full of frequency converters. So we do, for our machines and the Hammerfest machine, the frequency converters are onshore um, on the basis that we don't think that they're really reliable enough to put um, offshore. So this is why you have to have one cable per machine. Some other people have made different decisions from this. And then you have the variable frequency drive here, so you control the speed and, and the voltage from here. Bits going in, so this rather artistic picture is um, the GOC DME um, jacket Neptune. Um, it's only, people thought till recently that you couldn't use these, that we were really stuck with jack-up vessels or moored barges. No, not jacket vessels, DP vessels, or moored barges. Um, there had been a, a failed attempt to install something at EMEC um, for Voigt, where the, the machine sort of really came, fell off site, the jacket barge, and that really put people off, and nobody was sure it was okay. Demi then did quite a lot of work to actually control the vibrations of the legs is the main thing, and the natural frequency of the, the whole system. And then proved this. They went to a French site in five meters current, um, 56 meters deep, I think it was. It was quite a good test. And they, 
jacked up in that and stood there um, and did very well and really proved that it's possible. So these are now definitely an option and we've been using these. They give you quite a lot more deck space and the ability to jack up and just stay there. You don't have to sort of worry about the changes in the, the current or the tides. Even though DP vessels can in theory stay there, they're limited by weather. This is much less limited and gives you much more flexibility. And then this is one of the first um, foundations going in. So for this first project, we're using gravity-based foundations. So basically, you just put an awful lot of weight, sort of 1,500 tons of weight on this to keep it down. Um, it probably is not the long-term solution because 1,500 tons of anything just costs too much. Um, you're talking of a sort of million pounds just of dead weight. It's got to be... You can make monopiles or other things that only weigh 100 tons or maybe 150 tons, um, much lighter. Um, the difficulty is the methodology of getting them in there. And actually, these jack-ups will probably help on that. So I think next, this is probably the last time we use um, gravity bases. I think it'll be monopiles next time. But that's been changed by, by the technology, by the availability of that, those jack-ups. Yeah, yeah. Another picture of it, the, uh, the foundation being lowered in. Um, this is then the Hammerfest vessel, Hammerfest turbine going in. Um, so Hammerfest have produced a one megawatt device. Well, they produced that 300 one I showed you earlier in Norway. They then had a one megawatt device in at um, EMEC for a year, I think, something like that. Um, now they've stepped up. This is pretty different. It's changed. It was taken over. The company was taken over by Andritz, which is a big German hydro company. And they fairly sort of significantly revised it and included a lot of their own kit in there. So it's a fairly new machine and 1.5 megawatts this time. But that's it being lowered into the water off... Uh, the Olympic Ares, which is again a big DP vessel. And these things aren't really suitable for what we want to do. They have you know, cranes which are, well, this is actually quite a heavy machine. Um, but uh, this is designed for extended work offshore in the North Sea on oil and gas platforms. So you can sleep, you know, 80, 90 people on these and stay there for months at a time, which we don't need. Um, and I think one of the things that will get our cost out is if we can get vessels that are suited to working just offshore and quick trips and not long duration, you could you know, halve or a quarter the cost of the vessels, then we can bring down the cost of installing these things. Um, it's slightly odd that uh, an Atlantis project, when Atlantis owns Majent, has this, these two different types of turbines there. So we have our AR1500 and the HS1000, they call it, even though it's 1500. Um, it was quite, you could have expected us to have just chosen our own machines. There was a quite a complicated history in this which involved um, an electricity company called International Power which owned, was invested in tidal generation at that point and they owned the grid connection and they got involved in Maygen and said they'd only invest in Maygen if they could bring tidal generation with them. So that the, from the start it was uh, a it was in, written in that there would be two types of turbine. And interestingly, tidal generation weren't interested in doing it. They didn't want to modify their machine for the quite severe major end site. Um, but they kept the idea of having two different turbines. Um, part of th that's actually been quite useful because the funders see that as de-risking it. So if one of the turbines has a problem, the other one will probably be okay if something's inherent. Um, yeah. And the other thing that was that... Um, Hammerfest, through their installation at EMEC, actually managed to get a £10 million grant from the government. Um, Mead grant. And the, uh, that obviously helped to, to fund the project. So it's gone ahead with... It was supposed to be three of each initially. In an attempt to get the total capital cost down, we went to four, which is three of theirs and one of ours. And that's what's happening. This is um, the Atlantis turbine coming out of um, Blythe, was, was Narek. Um, so we, we built it there, actually, and tested it there. We don't have our own factory. The long-term production we'll have to, to sort out, but it was actually quite a good place to, to build in. You can then put it straight on their Neptune test rig, and then it went from there up to Nig in Scotland, from where it was deployed. So that's, the, that's what we're making. Um, we've tried 
well, yeah, we tried to make it as simple as possible, but simple is perhaps, you know, it's quite difficult to make things completely simple. I mean, there are people who've tried to do simple things, but it usually ends up a bit more complicated. Um, but it is, it has got rid of as many systems as we can. It's got quite a lot of redundancy in there, which complicates it. Um, but so that the, you know, the gearbox and the generator, which are the only thing, real things that generate heat, are just cooled by the seawater going past, and there's no extra systems. Um, we've basically got two of everything on the I.O. side and multiple things, so like sort of robots in films, you can rewire them and get the power going a different way to make things happen on everything except the main system. It's, it's 150 tonnes, which seems quite heavy, but it's actually quite light compared with most of the others around, um, which means that you can pick it comfortably with a standard 250 tonne DP crane. Um, and we've put a lot of effort into the marine operations of this. It's, it's installed with a DP vessel, but it's, we've got a number of systems that allow you to go and retrieve it without any divers, put it down. Um, this bit, just held by gravity on its foundation, and it makes the connections with the cable automatically, just as you drop it, the, the wet mates come together. It's taken a lot of time to get that to work, but we hope that that will be a sort of step forward for everybody. Now, I don't think this works here, so I'm going to... How am I doing on time? I'm all right at the moment. I will open up something. Now, how do I go full screen? That one. This is just... Whilst I'm talking, this is just the assembly of the turbine. It's quite fun time-lapse video of what was happening at um, Blythe with the various bits coming in. So this is a test hall. Some of you will have been there, um, but these are various components being delivered. A lot of this early stuff is just set up, um, getting bits in place, and then we start putting the machine together. So this is getting their test rig sorted. So this is the gearbox. Gearbox and the generator are actually sort of integrated. There's no, the generator bearings are the gearbox bearings to try and simplify things a bit so that it's all covered by the same lubrication system. Permanent magnet generator, the two speed, two stage rather, um, gearbox, uh, which seems to give the best balance of um, reliability and sort of weight and complexity and efficiency. Low speed shaft coming in, nacelle coming in, which is is really just a bit of metal that holds all the other bits together. Uh, and we have a, a stand for building it. A lot of moving things around. So this isn't a production system yet, it takes far too long, but it will get there. It didn't happen at quite this speed. That's the coupling that clamps the, the low-speed shaft into the hollow gearbox shaft. Transformer there that went round the back so that we could actually generate it, generate it at four kilovolts. And we put the things together, so the gearbox and generator onto the back. Low speed shaft going in, the main shaft that supports the, the rotor. With a seal here, the, the main rotating seal um, keeps the water out of the turbine. The only other rotating seal is in the yaw device drive here. Actually, no, and the, the pitch bearings are also over there. An independent bit, it's the pitch floods, it doesn't flood the nacelle. So we're now getting ready to lift the thing up so that it can actually go onto the, uh, the Narek Nautilus machine. That's a, a coupling that um, means that we don't impose loads on their device. So this is the drive here. This has got a, a motor over here and then a, a 
thing they called a FAS, which I forget the, what it stands for, but it allows you to provide to put moments and forces on like a real tidal rotor, though, though slightly slower than a real tidal, tidal rotor. That's a, this is this FAS force application system, that's what it is. And this goes up to, this can produce up to three megawatts, um, or equivalent of a three megawatt turbine, we're only using half of it. But this is where you know, the engineering gets interesting, you actually start seeing things, but it's complicated. Nothing, it's all so heavy that you can't pick up anything. Um, and we are, you're always, you know, there's a lot of preparation for this to make sure that you're not doing anything that's, that's remotely dangerous or that you're taking all the risks you can, and to control the quality. It is very important for these that they are reliable. We are aiming at, eventually, somewhere between five and six years between services. So we would like to put this down and not see it for six years. It's going to take us a while to get there, but that means that you really have to get your quality build right. I think, I think that's probably about it. It is it. So, I will just leave you with that slide. So, any questions? This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.